Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends welcome to the class of public international law the topic that will we will be discussing now is use of force and international humanitarian law lecture number 10 i am dr ashutosh acharya from law center 2 faculty of law university of delhi i am senior assistant professor at the same institution well friends it is quite an intriguing topic an interesting one largely because of the fact because at around the globe in early times or medieval times or even in modern times we see use of force by states against each other either to safeguard their own interest or to promote one's interest or to expand one's territory or for any other interest we see use of force in every decade almost it has never been a time of complete peace complete peace has become an ideal use of force can be witnessed any time every time war is considered to be inevitable after the second world war states did realize that going for war can be destructive especially after states realized that now states are in possession of weapons that are of mass destruction certainly that helped in a certain manner in a manner where states want to continue to exist at least in the fashion that allows them to dominate the world by having possession of weapons of mass destruction but what about those states that do not possess weapons of mass destruction and they are majority in number and therefore to an extent it brings a stability wherein states have decided post second world war in express terms that there must not be use of force we have united nations organizations established after second world war that through its charter guarantees that states must not resort to use of force and when we say use of force we mean to say that use of arms against another state use of arms against another state to fulfill one's own interest and therefore any conflict or dispute if it may arise must be resolved through pacific settlement or through pacific mode of settlement through peaceful settlement by adopting measures such as mediation negotiation arbitration or any other peaceful me means that a state may deem fit but in any case must avoid use of force against each other because that will lead ultimately to loss of life and destruction and once force is used it sees no end unless and until major or maximum destruction has been caused and this can be evidenced and witnessed through history and in history that we have seen mass destruction either of property or of life either in second world war or in first world war or multiple wars that happened either in europe or in africa or in asia or in america war doesn't bring good to anyone it brings destruction and nothing more and therefore it is the duty of the states to not to resort to use of force but even then if there is use of force either under the right of self defense or under new normative order of anticipatory self defense or under humanitarian intervention it must take care of certain rules of warfare 
rules of warfare are not new. They can be traced back since the times of Mahabharata or Ramayana. For example, weapons of mass destruction could not be used was the order during the times of Mahabharata as well. We see that only after informing the enemy or the opposite party or by blowing shank, we see that war would start. You cannot act surprisingly against the enemy soldiers or enemy army. You will have to inform the other party, the opposite party that you are going to attack. The other party or the opposite party, the enemy must be armed. An unarmed enemy should not be attacked. These were certain rules at the time of Mahabharata as well. During the time of Ramayana also, the same rules prevailed that after sunset, no warfare, either in Mahabharata or Ramayana. We can trace such rules in ancient scriptures as well. We see that even in other religions and regions and civilizations, the rules of warfare were intact. It is only the modern times where we see the rules of warfare are recognized in theory, but in practice, we see often getting these rules of warfare violated. But then the rules of war warfare are still in their place and they are binding on the parties involved in armed conflict. And for that, we have international humanitarian law. International humanitarian law takes care of the situation once war has begun. Once war has begun, it lays down certain rules and regulations with respect to weapons that one can use, the parties which will include civilians, children and unarmed personals must not be attacked. What kind of precautionary measures the states must take, military personnel must take as far as armed attacks are concerned or armed warfare is concerned, all of which is governed under international humanitarian law. So the learning objective for the day would be to understand the concept of law of war to understand the regime of humanitarian law, to visit the historical development of humanitarian law, to measure the application of international humanitarian law, to understand the difference between use of force and rules governing laws of warfare. As I said, international humanitarian law or humanitarian law in general has not been a product of 20th or 21st century. It's been since ages where, from where we can trace application and recognition of international humanitarian law or humanitarian law in general. It derives its existence from custom also. The states tend to practice and if the, even if they violate at least for legitimate reasons and for the argument of legitimacy, no state would deny existence of such rules of warfare. They would often come and claim violation by the other party as far as such humanitarian laws are concerned. Even if they are on the, even if they are at the place where a particular state has violated, it will not negate the fact to justify. So they will, even if a particular state has violated particular humanitarian law, it will go on to justify the act that it has committed. For legitimacy purposes, it will not deny that such humanitarian rules are not applicable on that particular state because humanitarian laws are applicable at all times once warfare has started, once armed conflict has begun. So therefore, if you look at use of force, in today's time, we have a codified law which prohibits expressly use of force and that is mentioned under Article 2, Clause 4 of the United Nations Charter and it says, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. So it is not only a codified law which seeks to protect territorial integrity or political independence of sovereignty of a particular state that can be caused or the, that can be adversely affected by use of force. So the protection regime is not something which is codified but also finds its place in customary practices as well. So it is not that states that are only party to the United Nations Charter are bound by Article 2, Clause 4, but since it exerts a peremptory norm of international law, 
That is, an act of aggression must not be undertaken by any state. It is completely prohibited. So therefore, even the states that are not party to the United Nations Charter are bound by this particular provision because of the status that it carries in today's time. We see that use of force is not something which is assumed or which has been presumed in the scenario that only a state attacks first against another state. So it is not that only state A attacks state B and that is use of force. Sometimes what happens is state B can also attack state A and that state B will do under the garb of right to self-defense. So we see that as a rule using force is prohibited but then there is a certain exceptional scenario mentioned under article 51 which says that you can use force but only in exercise of right to self-defense. So prima facile use of force is prohibited but then in modern times we have seen a jurisprudential development coming out of practical application of certain states of actions by United Nations organization itself. We see that states by taking the defense of collective security, not only taking the defense of self-defense will allow you to use force, but then there is another area through which states have justified their using of force in the modern times after coming into being of United Nations Charter. But point to be noted here is that in principle they are still against using force. Even if they use the force, they will try to justify it either on the grounds or basis of self-defense and when they do so, they do so on certain two other grounds or basis. What are these two other grounds and basis that finds its genesis in 20th century and then carried forward in 21st century as well. These two bases are peremptory self-defense or peremptory use of force, anticipatory self-defense synonymously they can be used and the other base is humanitarian intervention. Well friends, preemptive force or anticipatory self-defense is that when states anticipate that force is going to be used against them. So in order to protect themselves in advance, in anticipation, if a state or a states use force, it is known as anticipatory self-defense. In other words, if the state or a states preempt any strike that is going to happen against them or that is going to take place against them. So in order to protect themselves, they will first strike by preempting that particular act. Well, this is much disputed and it is still in dispute and it was also in dispute because on case to case basis, circumstantial basis, it may be justified. But whenever and wherever we see this particular argument of preemptive self-defense or anticipatory self-defense has been used, they have tried to justify it that an attack was going to happen and for that certain evidences are also produced. So a justification is produced. Justification is a sign that as a matter of policy, states tend to refuse any use of force. They do not want this to become a rule. So if states collectively under collective security or individually use force, they will try to justify it under the garb of preemptive strike, preemptive use of force or anticipatory self-defense. Well, this idea first, first came into being through Carolina incident wherein a ship was bombarded in anticipation, a Canadian ship was bombarded in anticipation that the British vessel was being harmed. Another basis apart from anticipatory self-defense is humanitarian intervention. Now, based on humanitarian intervention argument, we have seen that states have attacked other states just to save population residing in that particular state. Now, the argument is largely based on colonial times or removal of colonization, suppression of people either through colonization or through um, suppression of right to self-determination wherever is seen. So wherever we see that there is human rights violation, there is torture happening over a mass population, states come as a savior to protect those people. Or we can say that if a particular regime is rising to such an extent that ultimately it will lead to destruction of 
global interest based on human rights or humanitarian concerns. So, for example, if let us say that in a particular region, a terrorist group comes into power, a militant group comes into power over which no state has control, there is no responsibility which has been taken on behalf or in favor of this particular militant group and it is believed that this militant group or terrorist group can harm the whole humanity in future or it is dangerous for the humanity in future. Then uh, based on this particular argument, humanitarian intervention in those regions can be taken. For example, we, see, we saw that in Syria where ISIS had taken control over a certain region where states interfered the, within the activities happening in Syria, we can say that it was considered to be humanitarian intervention. In Iraq also, when Iraq took control over Kuwait and when states interfered in the matter between Kuwait and Iraq where Kuwait was struggling against the overpowering by Iraq, we saw humanitarian intervention happening. United Kingdom justifying its acts in Kuwait against Iraq basis based on humanitarian intervention. So, we see newness of legal position coming into being as far as use of force is concerned, where states tend to justify their actions as far as their use of force is concerned. Now, apart from the concept of use of force, once use of force has taken place, once warfare has started, once armed conflict has started, what are the rules that states must follow as far as warfare is concerned? So, let me give you a historical trace of international humanitarian law that how in different civilizations, either in different religions or regions, we see and we can trace the existence of rules of warfare. Now, if you see warfare traditions of the world, which talks about methods and means of warfare, it has been noted from the six secret teachings, ancient China, 11th century BC. It was said by Jiang Zia of Taigong. Do not set fire to what the people have accumulated. Do not destroy their houses, nor cut down the trees at grave sites or altars. So, something that does not form the target of military should not be hampered, which may be food, which may be innocent, non-combatants, etc. has been identified not only in China, but also we see that in ancient Greece, Koina Nomina in the common customs of warfare in 6th century BC has said, the use of non-traditional Greek infantry arms should be limited. Further, we see in the Code of Manu, chapter 7, verse 90, around 2000 years ago in Indian subcontinent, it was said that when he fights with his foes in battle, when he fights with his foes in battle, let him not strike with weapons concealed in wood, nor with such as are barbed, poisoned or the points of which are blazing with fire. So, one must not use weapons of such a nature which are of a nature that can cause unnecessary or superfluous injury or pain. So, the military objective should be to bring your enemy under control, to achieve the required target. The objective should not be to cause unnecessary pain to the enemy. Then we note in the first caliph, we note in uh, Caliph Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the first caliph after the Prophet Muhammad in 6th to 7th century and he says, refrain from betrayal, extravagance, perfidy or mutilation, never kill small children, nor old men or women, never cut or set fire to palm trees, never cut fruit bearing trees, never slay a goat, a cow or a camel except for food. If you pass by people devoted to worship, leave them to do. So, again certain cir circumscription or you can say circumscribed limits are provided in religious texts or in ancient texts as far as warfare is concerned or rules of warfare are concerned. Malik ibn Anas ibn Malik ibn Amr al Azbahim Distinguished scholar of Islamic law of 8th century says, In no circumstances shall women and children of the enemy be killed, even if they are used as human shields by soldiers. So, we see that in um, many warfares, either non-international or 
international armed conflict situations. We have seen in today's time also we see or in 20th century also we have seen that children and women are used as shields so that military personnel will not attack them. They know that they are not the actual targets of military objectives. So first rule is that they must not be used as shields in a warfare even if they are used the opposite party should not attack children and women if they are used as shields. Further, Maori warrior code of New Zealand 1864 says, if any Pake that is non-Maori person being a soldier by name shall be traveling unarmed and meet me, he will be captured and handed over to the direction of the law. So non-combatant unarmed person will not be attacked. Senegal oral tradition in Africa says, the ethics of war were taught to every young nobleman for his future as a warrior. He was taught never to kill an enemy on the ground because by falling, the enemy admitted his inferiority. So once your military objective is achieved, you have won the warfare, you must not cause unnecessary harm. Now, in modern times, what do we understand as far as IHL is concerned? What is it? IHL is a branch of international law that applies to situations of armed conflict. As I've already told you, it is a set of rules which seeks for humanitarian reasons to limit the effects of armed conflict. As we know that once warfare starts, once armed conflict starts, there is no limit. It can go up to any extent. IHL is the law which limits that particular, which limits the effects of warfare. By limiting the effects of warfare, by identifying that what weapons are allowed to be used, what are the principles that are applicable as far as warfare is concerned. So by limiting through various methods and establishing rules it actually goes on to reduce the sufferings as much as possible and reduce the destruction as much as possible because it, it is a well accepted fact that once warfare starts, you cannot completely avoid the destruction. But at least what you can do is you can reduce the destruction that will be caused through warfare. So therefore, the purposes of IHL is to reduce the unnecessary suffering, loss and damage in time of armed conflicts safeguard the fundamental human rights and dignity of persons, facilitate the restoration of peace. And this protection can be provided in two ways. As you can see, by protecting persons who do not or no longer participate in hostile action and by limiting the choice of means and methods of conducting military operations. Now, these two categories are dealt by two different categories of laws. As far as protection of persons, who do not participate directly into the hostile action are protected under Geneva laws or Geneva conventions. We will come to it also. And as far as limitation of the choice of means and methods of conducting military operations are concerned, it is governed by Hague law. And as far as the choice of means and methods of conducting military operations are concerned, we see that you cannot use any or any kind or any type of weapon that you have discovered or that you have invented. A weapon causing unnecessary harm should be restricted, should not be used. A weapon that can cause extraneous damage such as weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, biological weapons or weapons that touch to the bodily surface and then blast, flame throwing guns or any other kind of weapon that can cause unnecessary suffering should be limited should not be used and that is also governed by IHL. Now, if you look at IHL and the international legal contest in a holistic fashion, you will find use at bellum, use in bellow and IHRL that is human rights law working all together at the same time. Now, what is use at bellum? Use at bellum is the rules governing the legality of the use of force that, that once an attack has taken place, what is the legality as far as the attack is concerned. As I was saying that in 20th and 21st century, we have seen anticipatory actions coming into being or humanitarian interventions coming into being. You said Bellum questions all those forces that have been used or all those actions that have been taken either in anticipation or humanitarian intervention. So the state that has actually used the force will justify either on the basis of preemptive action or humanitarian action. If it fails to justify, it will certainly be responsible and will be liable for breach of international obligation mentioned under United Nations Charter or breach of preemptive norm of international law. So therefore, United Nations Charter is the law which prohibits under 2 clause 4 
any use of force allows only either collective self defense which must be also backed by resolution of united nations security council so security council being the executive body being the prime organ one of the prime organ of the united nations organization who has a important task of maintaining international peace and security around the globe so in order to maintain international peace and security it may resort to collective security actions and if it does so it is justifying the use of force at the same time if a state a attacks a state b a state b if uses force it can justify its use of force however a state a might not be able to justify its use of force but then a state b certainly is in a position to justify it under article 51 and that is right to self defense so this is one law which prima facie tries to restrict states from to res from resorting to any type of use of force once force has been used then comes your use in bello that is rules governing the conduct of hostilities and for this you have geneva conventions additional protocols and other instruments within which also falls hague laws as well what weapons should can be used what are the means and methods that can be employed as far as armed conflicts are concerned and at the same time who is protected what is the protectionist regime all of which falls in the domain of use in bello that is rules governing the conduct of hostilities at the same time we have third category of international law which protects individuals under international human rights law so you have udhr that is universal declaration of human rights then you have international covenant on civil and political rights and then i international covenant on economic social and cultural rights and certain other human rights instruments are present which are also applicable at the same time it is not that once humanitarian law comes into force human rights get suspended yes it is difficult to realize iccpr or ecosoc at the time of warfare but it is not that these laws also get suspended the agenda or the object is to reach to a situation where UDHR ICCPR and ECOSOC rights are also realized to the people to the population of the state or of the region which is involved in warfare now if you look at international humanitarian law and once violations are placed once breach of obligations are in place what is the source of law from which we can say that a particular international obligation has been breached so once there is a breach you need to identify what particular international law has been breached so we need to then understand what is the source of international humanitarian law again friends in the second lecture that is sources of international law we had identified that icj under it, its statute article 38 of the same statute identifies in clause 1 four sources of international law it is the same four sources of international law that would be helpful for us as far as ihl is concerned which will be international conventions international custom general principles of international law general prince principles of law recognized by civilized nations judicial decisions and teachings of the most highly qualified publicists of various nations as subsidiary means of determination of rules of law now what are the fundamental principles of international humanitarian law if we are talking about restricting the acts which are undertaken by the parties involved in armed conflict then what are the specific principles that the parties resorting to warfare must abide by so there are few principles which states in any situation must abide to as far as use of force is concerned or as far as the conflict situation is concerned use of arms are concerned so the first principle is military necessity this principle says it is permissible to use those measures not forbidden by international law which are necessary to secure the complete submission of the enemy as soon as possible with the least expenditure of personnel and resources so there are few elements of this particular requirement that is that least amount of resources must must be utilized least number of personnels must be utilized as much only minimum number of the personnels to be utilized 
in order to achieve the greatest ad military advantage. But when this greatest military advantage is achieved, it must take care that the target that is to be achieved that is of complete submission by the opposite army of opposite forces, only that much target should be achieved that is not more than what is required to allow the submission of opposite forces and not more than that. Okay? So, you must restrict your actions, you must preempt your actions before you go on to actually use those actions, use those resources and personnel. Recognizes that use of force during armed conflict is legal within the limits set out by IHL. Further recognizes that legitimate military targets can be attacked, destroyed and enemy combatants killed for legitimate military purposes. So, only to achieve your military objective, only for that particular aspect and only for that particular purpose, attacks should be targeted. A non-combatant should not be attacked. A person who has surrendered should not be affected. Children or animal, innocent animal or forest for that matter should not be adversely affected as far as achieving military target is concerned. So, as much less destruction as possible should be caused. So, military necessity is a principle which allows the forces to use force only that is necessary, only to the extent that is necessary, quantitatively as well as qualitatively. Next is principle of humanity and it says it is forbidden to inflict suffering, injury or destruction not actually necessary to accomplish a legitimate military purpose. The very purpose of IHL aims at protecting the victims of armed conflict. You see, if I take the example of Vietnam warfare, we can say that certain arms were used which were causing suffering to the opposite parties. Yes, we also see that in Vietnam warfare, guerrilla warfare method was adopted by Vietnamese forces fighting US forces. At that point of time, in order to combat guerrilla method of warfare, we saw that flame guns were used. So, these flame guns would burn the trees altogether. It would not only burn the trees, but if a combatant is hiding behind a tree, it would burn that particular individual also. So, killing a combatant or targeting a combatant by using flame guns is considered to be use of superfluous power or superfluous arms. Because a person if it is targeted or if a military personnel or if a combatant is targeted, the killing must happen by causing least or minimum suffering and pain. But assume a situation where a person either dies or does not die or is severely injured by burning. So, in such a situation, such arms must be prohibited and they were prohibited also at a later point of time. So, what we see here is that humanity must be kept intact or principle of humanity is applicable at all times whenever there is an armed conflict situation or warfare is going on. IHL strikes a balance between two things that is military necessity because under military necessity it allows you to use force once warfare is going but with minimum use of resources and minimum use of personnel only to achieve military target. But then at the same time you have another principle of humanity which says that you must maintain the decorum and sanctity of humanity by not inflicting suffering or unnecessary injury or destruction that is not required to achieve military target. So, in the military necessity, use of armed force to attain legitimate military objectives and complete submission of enemy is lawful. At the same time, it is forbidden to inflict suffering, injury or destruction, not actually necessary to accomplish a legitimate military purpose. So, these two principles are not opposite to each other, rather they try to suffice the purpose, the, the whole, whole holistic purpose of reaching out to proportionality or reaching out to a proportional act as far as use of force is concerned. 
So, the balance between military necessity and humanity is achieved through the application of the principle of proportionality. Now, friends, what do we mean by proportionality? The principle says that when attack is made, when combat is happening between two forces, we see that at a number of times, collateral damage also happen. It is not that in modern times, we do not see only warfare happening or conflict happening on land. We see use of airplanes, we see use of missiles and we see use of modern weapons that have now come into being. Now, in the times where we see modern weapons, we see a situation where these weapons do not discriminate or distinct between a combatant and a non-combatant. They do not distinct or create or distinguish between a building which is occupied by military personnel or whether it is a hospital. The missiles, the weapons of destruction or of mass destruction that are now used by the states, they do not take care of the aspects of military necessity or humanity, but those states are bound by those principles, either military necessity or humanity. And when both combine together, they seek to achieve one single purpose and that is proportionality, that attack should be proportional in nature, that attack should be of such magnitude that it does not affect the civilians, it does not affect the children, it does not affect cultural heritages of that particular state. So, complete destruction should not be the military objective, only submission by the opposite party should be the objective of the state involved in warfare. So, it says collateral damage shall be proportionate to the con concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. So, even if there is collateral damage, they must anticipate, the attacking force must anticipate that the collateral damage is to the minimum. What is collateral damage? Collateral damages are incidental loss to of civilian life, injury to civilians and damage to civilian objects. And when we say civilian objects, it may include schools, it may include cultural heritages, it may include hospitals and other buildings. What is a military advantage? A military advantage is the total or partial destruction, capture or neutralization of a combatant or military objective necessary for the ultimate submission of the enemy. And when we look at this particular picture, you can see clearly that there is non-proportional opposition. On the one side, you can see a number of tanks and the other side, you can see there are few personnels, military personnels with only a stand gun. Here, you do not require these arm, here you do not require these armaments, these tanks to be used against such a small military group. And if you use these tanks, it may lead to non-proportional destruction as it will cause unnecessary suffering and destruction of civilian life and civilian objects. Okay? So, proportionality forms the basis of armed conflict situation wherever there is a conflict between two states. You must use force in proportion causing as much less damage and destruction as much possible, only up to that extent which is required. Now, for that, there are established fundamental rules which limit the use of force when parties are at conflict. The right of parties to a conflict to choose methods and means of warfare is not unlimited as we have already identified. It dates back to St. Peterburg Declaration 1868. So, as I said, that if a weapon is used, if an armament is used, it must not cause unnecessary suffering and loss. So, in 1863, we see, we see that Russia had invented a gun with a bullet which will blast once it comes in contact with a human body. So, those bullets were then prohibited because it would cause unnecessary suffering to human body and might not result into ultimate achieving of the object of military target or military objectives are not actually achieved. Even if they are achieved, they are not proportional in nature. A bullet that causes immediate death or immediate achieving of the object would be much better as compared to a bullet that would cause unnecessary suffering and harm. 
So a prohibition of bullets that exploded on collision came into being in 1868. Codified in modern IHL treaties, we see that Article 35 of Additional Protocol 1 of the Geneva Convention also limits the means and methods of warfare and it, and it prohibits use of weapons which are intended or are expected to cause widespread, long term and severe damage to the natural environment. IHL recognizes two categories of persons in armed conflicts in order to create distinction as far as armed targets or that is the combinants and the non-combatants are concerned. So, combatants can be attacked and non-combatants should not be attacked. Combatants have the right to participate directly in hostilities. Civilians are considered to be non-combatants and are protected. Civilians have the general right to protection against the effects of hostilities but cannot participate in hostilities. Once they start participating in hostilities, then they are, then they lose the category of protection that they carry as civilians. So, distinction also says or the rule of distinction also says that the parties to a conflict shall at all times distinguish between the civilian population and combatants, military objectives and civilian objects. Attacks shall be directed solely against combatants and military objectives. And if you look at the distinction, some example are presented here before you. As you can see, a person carrying a gun would be considered to be a military personnel as far as any warfare type of situation is concerned. A military tank would be considered to be a, an arm or would be considered to be a part of attack or an object of attack. Whereas there are certain emblems which are used by certain personnel, there are certain signs which are used by certain personnel which may be acting as a nurse wherein a doctor is saving the lives of the injured, if where a nurse is treating the wounded in the conflict zone, they must not be attacked. A civilian population residing in the conflict region must not be attacked. So there are various signs and signias and emblems that denote, that identify that these are the places, these are the people that should not be attacked and they are protected under the regime of international humanitarian law. But at the same time, we can identify that there are buildings which are of military significance, there are weapons, there are tanks, there are individuals which are of military significance, they can be targeted. A godown consisting of weapons and other materials that would be used by the military personnel can be attacked because it can be a military target or military objective to weaken the opposite military that can be targeted. But a hospital is treating the wounded and it does not serve the purpose to target a hospital or a school or civilian population because it will not directly participate in the hostilities and cannot be a military target. So distinction is to be brought into place and this distinction must be respected by the forces involved in armed conflict. Now when we see non-discriminate or indiscriminate attack taking place, you can see the picture of a certain place where indiscriminate attack has been taken place. The best example that we can cite here is of Hiroshima and Nagasaki incidents when those atomic bombs were dropped in these two cities. It was, it will be considered to be an indiscriminate attack. It is still in question that whether any military objective was achieved by dropping bombs, whether even if it was achieved, whether the collateral damage was proportional, proportionate in nature or not. Well, the history has decided and it will continue to decide whether those acts were legal or not legal. Further, apart from proportionality principle, we have precautionary measures that one must take into account and the rule of precautionary measures says, during military operations, all feasible precautions must be taken to spare the civilian population and objects and protect them against the dangers resulting from the effects of hostilities. Verify that objects are legitimate military targets. Avoid locating military objectives within or near the civilian population related to the principle of distinction. Superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering. It says the use of weapons, materials and methods of warfare of a nature to cause superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering is prohibited. Article 35 clause 3 of additional protocol 1 says that it is prohibited to use methods 
and means of warfare which are intended or may be expected to cause widespread, long term and severe damage to natural environment. So, this is an article of additional protocol 1 of the Geneva Conventions which tries to protect the environment as well. It is not only the civilians and the civilian objects that must be protected, but also the environment. If any attack, if any kind of attack or if any method or means of warfare tends to affect a particular protected environmental area, marine environment or a jungle or a forest area, which is not necessarily a military target just to cause superfluous harm to other party, such actions must also not be undertaken. So, where again I would say that if military necessity and proportionality principle and humanity principle are combined together, then we can say that not only civilians or civilian objects, but also environmental protection should also be taken care of. The means and methods of warfare which are intended to cause widespread, long term and severe must be avoided. Precautionary measures should be taken by the forces undertaking armed attacks against the other forces. Largely, if you look at the victims of armed conflict, it is the wounded and sick and the shipwrecked personnels. And we have a Geneva Convention to protect or which brings these personnels, these particular categories of people under its protection. At the same time, we have persons deprived of liberty and we have civilians. We have civilian protection, we have convention to protect civilians also Geneva Convention, then we have convention to protect the prisoners of war as well at the same time. So, there are laws in place which tries to protect different categories or which tries to protect different types of categories of victims as far as international humanitarian law is concerned. Now, if you look at the historical development, certainly we have traditional rules of war, rules that became more authoritative with the rise of centralized power in the states. Over time, we see that these rules that were practiced became law or you can say concretized into law. In 1864, the first Geneva Convention came into being and for the first time, a multilateral treaty provided for the protection of persons in wartime. In 1861, we see Lieber Code coming into being. In 1861, the Frankis Lieber, a German-American professor of political science and law at Columbia University, prepared on behalf of President Lincoln a manual based on international law, the Lieber Code, which was put into effect for the first time in 1863 for the Union Army of the United States of States in the American Civil War that went, for, went from 1861 to 1865. So, we see a manual has to be created. All of these principles are very subjective or you can say are not concretized in their application. So, in order to concretize, in order to specify actual application of these principles, always a military manual is created. And we can see Lieber Code being the first of its kind manual as far as military code of conduct is concerned whenever there is warfare like situation, whenever there is armed conflict in place. So, this military manual which now almost all the states are having for their own military whenever they are involved in armed conflict, the militaries of different states must be thorough with this military manual and these military manuals tries to keep intact and implement military necessity principle, humanity principle and as well as precautionary and proportionality principle. Henry Dunant has played a significant role as far as the development of international humanitarian law is concerned and he came up with the two idea. He say, Henry Dunant, the Genovese merchant who in the Italian war of unification had witnessed the plight of 40,000 Austrian, French and Italian soldiers wounded on the battlefield of Solferino in 1859, published his impressions in his book, A Memory of Solferino. Now, he came up with two ideas, that is to create an organization of trained volunteers ready to assist wounded in war in every country, which led to the establishment of the ICRC, that is the International Committee for the Red Cross in 1863, which is exist in existence even today and is working towards the development and growth and implementation and application of international humanitarian law. To promote an international agreement protecting wounded soldiers in war and those who care for them and this led to the adoption of Geneva Convention of 1864. Now, 
there are various landmark conventions and treaties that comes into being in order to protect the civilians, civilian objects, environment and everything that is concerning, that is, con that is a matter of concern as far as international humanitarian law is concerned. So, we see in chronological order that in 1864, first Geneva Convention comes into being for wounded on the battlefield and it protects the wounded on the battlefield as they require medical attention. In 1868, St. Petersburg Declaration comes into being which outlaws certain projectiles which causes superfluous and unnecessary and indiscriminate harm to the other sides, other forces or civilians. In 1899-1907, Hague Conferences comes into being. Then in 1906, Second Geneva Convention for wounded, etc., etc. In 1925, Geneva Gas Protocol comes into being. In 1929, we see Third Geneva Convention comes into being, which takes care for the prisoners of war. It sets down rules and regulations as far as treatment of prisoners of war is concerned. For example, that they must be treated with humanity, with dignity. They must not be tortured. And once warfare ends, they must be returned back to their original state or original region or place of nationality. So, prisoners of war are not the personnels who should be subjected to torture, who should be killed or targeted. Rather, prisoners of warfare must be kept intact in a particular place where they are not harmed. A dignified treatment of all care must be provided to the prisoners of warfare and rules pertaining to all of this is dealt under third Geneva Convention for POWs. Then we see in 1949, four Geneva Conventions coming into being. In 1954, Hague Cultural Property Conventions. In 1972, Biological Weapons Convention. In 1977, first and second additional protocols. In 1980, Conventional Weapons Convention. And then in 1993, Chemical Weapons Convention. In 1997, Anti-Personal Landmines Ban. In 1998, International Criminal Court comes into being. And then, or you can say, Rome Statute is drafted. And then, as a result of Rome Statute, International Criminal Court comes into being. Now, International Criminal Court is the body where once we have identified that there has been a violation of international humanitarian law. So, to indict a particular individual under the regime of violation of international humanitarian law, International Criminal Court is the place where such indictment can take place or prosecution can take place. A person can be convicted if that person was involved in the commission of grave breaches such as genocide, war crimes or crimes against humanity, which again takes you back to the protection, the protectionist regime provided by IHL because once a particular person is found to found guilty of committing genocide, crimes against humanity or war crimes, that ultimately means that that particular individual through its position has breached or violated international humanitarian law. So, that particular individual can then be prosecuted before international criminal court. Yes, it has a different procedure, but we will not delve into that particular aspect because that is a different area and subject. In 2000, we see optional protocol for child soldiers was, has come into being. 2005, customary law study comes into being and 2008, cluster munitions convention come into being. Cluster munitions are nothing but weapons which or you can say bombs, cluster bombs are dropped from air into a particular land area or in a particular region. Now, if you use cluster munitions, it will lead to indiscriminate attack because cluster munitions are dropped from the air and they are not target based. So, in a particular region, it will cause a lot of or number of blast without discriminating between military and non-military targets. Similarly, chemical weapons, if you see, it will not differentiate between military or non-military targets or biological weapons, if you see, it will not discriminate between military and non-military targets. So, use of such weapons be it cluster munitions, chemical weapons or biological weapons go against the basic tenets and principles of international humanitarian law of military necessity or of that of uh, humanity or that of proportionality. So, 
we have treaty groups with respect to protection and then with respect to means and methods of warfare, what type of weapons should not be used and then customary law and other related laws as well. So there are two main branches of use in Bello, Geneva law and Hague law. Geneva law talks about humanitarian law proper which is designed to safeguard military personnel who are not or are no longer taking part in the fighting and persons not actively involved in hostilities. That is the four Geneva conventions. And then you have Hague law that is the law of war which establishes the rights and obligations of belligerents in the conduct of military operations and limits the means of harming the enemy. So we have the four Geneva conventions, the first one being for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded and sick in armed forces in the field, then second one for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded, sick and shipwrecked members of armed forces at sea and the third one concerning the treatment of prisoners of war, the fourth one concerning the protection of civilian persons in times of armed conflict situations. And you also have three additional protocols, first one being the protocol of 8 June 1977, additional protocol of Geneva Convention and of 12th August 1949 and concerning the protection of victims of international armed conflicts. Then you have the protection regime under, under additional protocol 2 for victims of non-international type of armed conflict situation and then you have the third additional protocol which is relating to the adoption of additional distinctive emblem. Now friends, apart from having all of these convention, the regime of Geneva law and the Hague law, we must see that even if there is a regime, even if there is an area, even if there is a particular object that is not or a subject which is not covered by any given law. So friends, if there is a subject which is not covered by any of the given law that we had just identified either Geneva laws or Hague laws or any other under any other convention or a treaty law or a local law, then there is a saving clause which covers all such situations which are not covered by the codified laws or any other international customary law of international humanitarian law. And that clause is known as Martin's Clause and it was formulated in 1899 and it reads and says, until a more complete code of the laws of war is issued, the high contracting parties think it right to declare that in cases not included in the regulations adopted by them, populations and belligerents remain under the protection and empire of the principles of international law as they result from the usages established between civilized nations from the laws of humanity and the requirements of the public conscience. So the laws of humanity and the requirements of public conscience would also come, would always come to rescue as far as protectionist regime is concerned. The Martin's Clause in the preamble to the Hague Convention on the laws and customs of war on land is an important legacy of those instruments. In the years since its formulation, the Martin's Clause has been relied upon in the Nuremberg jurisprudence addressed by the International Court of Justice and human rights bodies and reiterated in many humanitarian law treaties that regulate the means and methods of warfare. It was restated in 1949 Geneva Conventions for the Protection of Victims of War, the 1977 additional protocols to those conventions and the preamble to the Convention on the Prohibitions or, rest or Restrictions on the Use of Certain Conventional Weapons in slightly different versions. So even if there is no codified law, Martin's Clause will come into picture. With this, we can say that in the given discussions in the present topic, we try to understand the terminology, the religious and cultural traditions, the legal context that is of US at Balam and US in Bello. We also understood the purpose is to protect the victims of armed conflict. We understood the fundamental principles, fundamental rules, existing treaty law, Geneva law, Hague law and the Martin's clause. So with this we can say we now have a holistic view as far as use of force, that force is prohibited and then once force is used what is the international humanitarian law that can be engaged in order to protect the non-armed personnels in armed conflict situations. With this I end this particular lecture and I thank you for your patient listening. Namaskar.